So tonight we're here for our third part of our growth series. And uh, mostly we're gonna talk about deficiencies, how to read your plants, how to understand when they're talking to you, how to talk back to them. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about bugs. So these are things I hate talking about, but they are things that we all need to know about. So I think it's really important that we go over them. Um, but first we're gonna go through a couple of slides that are based on questions that I've had from other students who have gone through the class after the first and second class. And uh, so I'm gonna go through a few of those things based on those questions. If you guys have actually started growing about the time or popping seeds during our first class and you're going once every two weeks on these classes, you're about at the same point as the things we're gonna go over right now. And if not, just hold on tight, we'll get past it pretty quick. So there's a bug on my screen, go away bug. Seedlings, if you guys are started with seedlings, you gotta remember, keep that temperature up. Um, they really like it up to about 85 degrees, but between 70 and 85 is good. Humidity also can be up to about 85 degrees. Again, between about 75 and 85 is where you guys wanna be. Low light, now when I say low light, I mean it needs, it needs light all day or almost all day, 16 to 24 hours, but low light meaning we don't want to be blasting them with some high powered LEDs or a high powered HPS in the beginning. You wanna be more under either a fluorescent, a T5, um, a low wattage LED like our clone lights, um, something like that that's not going to blast them with just too much. At least that's just in the beginning of the seedling stage. Um, we always want air movement. So a little bit of fan on them, other than when they're in a dome. And even when they're in a dome, we wanna make sure we're opening it enough to give them some fresh air. And then light watering, no nutrients in the soil whatsoever. Um, very little nutrients in hydro. We wanna keep that really small um, so we're not burning them out right in the beginning. And then just keeping your environment really clean. Clean environment, excellent plants. Uh, when we're ready, if you're in our humidity dome, we're gonna open that up. And after a few days to a few weeks, we'll, we'll open it up, to, but keep a good eye on your plants. We wanna give them about a half an hour to make sure that they stay standing up. Um, once they are rooted well enough, they should stand up after a half hour of the dome being off. And then you can pull them out of the dome and go ahead and put them either into your hydro set, set up or into your soil. Um, Remember that you wanna start taking that temperature and humidity down about five degrees or 5% every week to two, if you can. Now, lots of times it's hard to do. Sometimes we have a room that's just always running at 80 degrees. We're always at 60% humidity. And I, I've had a lot of people say, well, what do I do? I can't get it down. Well, if, if you can't go with it because you're still gonna be able to grow some good medicine there. Nutrient feeding, we have our macronutrients, which is our NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, growing high quality flowers requires more fertilizer and nutrients than most common crops. Your plants need the following primary nutrients, which is your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So again, depending on the lights we're using, that may also make them need even more than the normal charts. Uh, now with a lot of the high powered LEDs, the plants just, they go through photosynthesis a lot more often, a lot faster. So they're requiring a lot more food to do this. So we got to really keep our eyes on this. And that's why we're going to teach you about how to read the leaves and how to know what the plant needs. Plants also need their micronet nutrients. Micronutrients um, are needed in a lot smaller quantities. And those include calcium, magnesium, iron, copper, zinc, nickel, chloride, molybdenum, and boron. Now, most of these you guys will get from the soils you use. If you're in hydroponics, you gotta add all of it because there's very little in the water. Um, although there will be some, if you have just city water, you'll have some of these things in there. But most of them will get out of the soils we use and we're not really adding in nickel chloride, molybdenum, boron, zinc, copper, iron. Those aren't things I've ever had to add to my grow other than in very small amounts that might already be in some of the nutrients that I'm giving them. If you're not using a pre-fertilized, amended, blended, or living organic soil mix, you will need to feed your plants at least once a week using the appropriate nutrient solution. These nutrients are sold in concentrated liquid or powdered form. 
meaning to be mixed with water and generally formulated for either vegetative or flower, the bloom growth. This is because cannabis has an ever-changing macronutrient requirements during this life cycle. It needs more nitrogen during the, the growth stage. It will need more phosphorus and potassium during the budding stage. So that's why we want to change it a little bit. Um, there are one and dones. So some people, if you don't really have the time or the physical, um, you're not physically able to be out working with your plants as often, some people are, are choosing to do a one and done, meaning we're giving it one thing through the whole life cycle. Um, but as I just mentioned, it really needs more nitrogen during growth, a little more phosphorus and potash during flowering and blood budding. So you are better off to at least use a two part. Um, and the, when we get into some of these uh, six part, eight part, 13 part nutrients lines, there is a reason why there are so many parts, um, but some nutrient lines have realized how they can put these together. So basically when you put two substances together and then you mix them together, sometimes they turn into a third inert substance. So that's why we've got so many different bottles of certain types. Most macronutrients are sold in two part or three part liquids to prevent that's what I just said. Certain elements from per precipitating, combining into an inert solid that is usable by the plant, meaning that you'll need to purchase two bottles, part A and part B, or 13 bottles. Uh, again, it kind of depends on what you're looking to get out of your plants and what you're looking to do for your plants. Most, most of the time, you will have to add some calcium and magnesium. That's pretty important. Um, and it's probably the biggest deficiency we see is CalMag. Once you purchase the necessary nutrient products, simply mix them with water as directed by the label or the chart and water your plants with the solution. You should always start with a half a strength or quarter strength and then work your way up. Once you know, like I've grown with, um, I've grown with lamb's bread, train rack, pineapple express, I've done them multiple times. I know they can take full strength right away, but there are some other things that they can't where I have to start small and then work my way up. It just depends on the strain you're working with. So if it's a new strain, take your time, start them off at quarter strength, half strength, and then work up over, the, for over a couple of weeks. It's almost always worse to overfeed your plants than underfeed them. Over time, you'll learn to read your plants for signs of deficiencies and toxicities. And that's what we're gonna get to in just a little bit here. Actually now, what are cannabis deficiencies? A cannabis deficiency is seen when the cannabis plant is unable to access key nutrient or a mineral essential for, essential for healthy growth. Even if your plants have a relatively healthy diet feed, the absence of a single essential nutrient can have profound effects. This can have a severe impact on yield and or quality. In the worst case, in worst cases, a cannabis deficiency can threaten the survival of your plant. Fortunately for us weed growers, the cannabis plant is able to communicate many of the common deficiencies and issues to us. It talks to us, but it talks to us by the signs it gives us and by what those leaves look like and by where we see issues on the plant. Assuming that we know what to look for and how to interpret the signs, we should be able to fix the issues. Visual clues from the leaves and general plant appearance can convey a lot to us can convey a lot of useful information to the experienced cultivator. One of the most surprising and frustrating features of cannabis growing is that your plants can have a nutrient deficiency even if you're providing a balanced feed. So I see this quite a lot. People will send me pictures and say, well, please, what's wrong with my plants? And we look at the pictures and by where the issues are and what the leaves look like, we'll be able to say, I think this is a nutrient deficiency. I think this is nitrogen or phosphorus or calcium. But the first thing I always ask everybody is, are you sure your pH is on? Because if your pH is off, we're gonna have what's called nutrient lockout. And once we have nutrient lockout, that plant's not gonna take any of the nutrients up. So we might look at it and say, wow, I got a phosphorus deficiency and add phosphorus, add phosphorus and deficiency gets worse. And it's sometimes getting worse because it's not a phosphorus deficiency. It's actually just that pH is off. So it's the first thing we always look at. Is my pH, has my pH been on? 
if we're not sure, if maybe we have a pH pen that's not a top of the line pen, maybe it's a little off, the first thing you wanna do is flush. Flush out that system as, fat, as, as good as you can. Um, now, when I say flush, I mean mix up some water, pH balance it to the best of your ability with whatever pH pen you have or litmus paper. Um, and then pour enough through there that you're getting at least the 30, 40, 50% of the water is coming back out the bottom. You know, fill up your saucer in the bottom and then suck it out with a vacuum cleaner if you, if you can or get it out of there, just dump it out. Um, but we want to flush it. Anytime we're in doubt, you're in doubt, flush it out. Um, and once we get that pH back to uh, what it should be in the soil, so if we're in soil or in the root zone, I mean, if we're in soil, it should be 6.3, 6.4. Um, unless we're using a few lines which require it to be higher, like nectar for the gods, we might have it up to about 6.8. If you are in cocoa or hydro, you're more around the 5.8 area. So we want to make sure that our root system is sitting in the right pH um, by what we're adding to it. And then once we do that, now if we look and say, okay, we flushed it out, we've given it a week, it still looks like I got a phosphorus deficiency, now we want to up the phosphorus a little bit. And I probably just said everything on this next slide. Let's see, before attempting to identify the cannabis deficiency, it's important to check that your pH is in the right region. That's exactly what I just said. Uh, so we'll skip through this. Sorry, I keep getting, I get on a tangent and I'll get a little ahead. Some local water sources have naturally high levels of some minerals, but may be low in others. This can be, tr this can make it tricky to use certain nutrient additives if you already have variable levels in your water supply. So we talked about this a little bit, I think in the first class that if you, if you have city water, get your water report. You'll find it online. And that water report's gonna tell you, I got a lot of boron in my water. You know, there'll be a scale on there that's gonna say normal. And then, so you'll know, am I high or am I low on boron? Is my water high or low in calcium, high or low in magnesium? And you can kind of, Use that knowledge. If you're really high in magnesium and you're using your water and you're not using an RO system or something to take that magnesium out, well, then you probably don't have a magnesium deficiency, or at least it's less likely to. So then we can kind of scratch that off and go to the next thing. Um, lots of times when we're trying to figure out what the plant needs, sometimes it's, it's obvious sometimes, and other times it's less obvious, and we need to tr a little trial and error until we get that plant healthy again. Um, but remember, it's weed. It's so we can get let it go pretty far and bring it back to life. It'll go. It is. It really is a weed. Um, macronutrients. Those are required in high quantities by your cannabis plant. The main macronutrients for cannabis are NPK, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. These are used in the primary biochemical processes during vegetative growth and bloom, where micronutrients are minerals that are required in trace quantities, much less. They ensure that the plant has good cellular biology, it can function well. Um, micronutrients include copper, silicon, zinc, sulfur, et cetera. Then we have mobile nutrients versus immobile nutrients and cannabis deficiencies. Um, understanding the subtle difference between mobile and immobile nutrients can help you understand cannabis deficiencies better. Mobile nutrients, such as phosphorus, can be transferred from one part of the plant to another. So if we see a phosphorus deficiency, because it can be transferred, what's happening is that plant, every time it's making new growth, it wants to make sure the new growth is healthy. So on a mobile deficiency, it will mobilize, it will pull whatever it's missing from the old growth and send it up to the new growth. So that way that new growth is looking healthy. So when we see, we first see a deficiency and it's in, in the older growth, the older big leaves towards the bottom, we know it's a mobile deficiency. So we're gonna look at our charts, which I'll get to in a little bit, and we're gonna see, look at the side for mobile and decide what it is that is our deficiency. So an immobile deficiency is gonna show up in that brand new growth because it's immobile. It, it's gonna, it, it has a deficiency. It doesn't have enough of something out of the root zone. It's gonna show it in that new growth right away. There's no way for it to take it from another part of the plant. Um, zinc is an immobile deficient or immobile 
mineral. So that would show up, like I say, new growth. As always with cannabis cultivation, problem prevention is far better than the cure. So one classic problem with mineral deficiencies that they're often misinterpreted and treated incorrectly, which only makes the problem worse. Some of the cannabis deficiencies can look similar and take an experienced eye to correctly identify. So we tell all of our customers, all of our students, anybody even watching at home, if you're unsure, reach out to us, send us a picture, you can send it by messenger, email, whatever, and ask our opinion. You know, we'll tell you what we think it is, but we're going to ask you a few questions. So if you actually send it along with your picture, where did I see this first, old growth or new growth? Good pictures of those leaves so we know what it's looking for, like. Good picture of the whole plant so we can kind of get an, uh, an idea of what's going on and hopefully give you the right answer. Uh, where was I? One basic way for soil growers to avoid deficiencies is to use high quality, professionally prepared soil. So anything that you get from a grow store like ours is gonna, one, it's going to be sterilized. There will be no bugs in the soil whatsoever, um, unless they've stored it outside. When, once you store the soil outside, definitely there can, can get some bugs in it, um, but it's high quality soil. So. Unlike Home Depot, nothing here. None of our dirt has any dirt in it. As I mentioned before, it's peat moss. It's then it's got um, nutrients within that. And they're going to be all natural. There'll be things like bone meal, feather meal, bat guano, seabird guano, um, but all natural things that will help feed your plant. So, because of the way they formulate those soils, they're pretty high in macronutrients, and it's going to give your plants what it needs. And we're more worried about the NPK the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, and a little bit about the calcium and magnesium. If you're unfortunate enough to have a sick plant with deficiencies, it helps to get on top of the situation as quickly as possible. If a plant continues to suffer with deficiencies, it usually means you're severely comprom a severely compromised harvest. So you will definitely get a smaller yield if it's compromised too long. Um, in the worst case scenario, your plant might not even survive. When a plant is in good health, it is far more resistant to pests and disease than a plant which is already compromised by poor health and poor nutrition. So if you ever do get any kind of bug, you'll notice that it goes to the most unhealthy plant in the room uh, by far. Your healthier plants will be more resistant to everything. So next we're gonna show you this chart. Now, anytime you guys want, these charts are all over the internet. If you just put in cannabis deficiency chart, a whole bunch will pop up. And the charts are great because when you have an issue with your plant, you're going to pull up that chart and look at it. So for instance, oops, uh oh, I just lost where I was. Sorry, guys. There we go. It's trying to get a little closer so I can see. So I can't see on mine. Um, it shows you right at the top on the, on the left there. The first three leaves, it is an early stage, late middle stage and, and toxicity of nitrogen deficiency. So in the early stage, it's gonna start showing those intervenal fluorosis, that little yellowing, and it'll go on from there. So I, I can send everybody a copy of this whole thing and it'll also be online for you guys to, to look at it. Um, but yeah, it'll be posted in a group, but also if you want to take pictures of any of these, we have it on book form and you guys can pull it, open it up after class and so you get some better pictures. Um, I do keep a copy of these on the wall in my grow so that I can refer to them at any time. You know, after a while, you don't have to anymore. You start to remember, but for many years, I, and still I will refer to them just to be sure. Um, this is another chart. This is a pretty neat one because it actually shows the cannabis plant what a deficiency versus an excess is. Because if you give it too much of something, it's going to respond totally different than too little of something. Too much nitrogen, you're going to get really dark green leaves. Um, actually, we're going to hop into nitrogen right now. So nitrogen, chemical symbol is N. It's regarded as a mobile macronutrient. Not only is nitrogen an essential part of the plant proteins, it is vital for healthy functioning of photosynthesis, especially in vegetative growth. 
Symptoms. Nitrogen deficiency can result in leaves looking pale and eventually turning yellow, curling, and dropping off. Leaves near the base of the plant can be first to display it. Yellowing can progress up the plant. Leaf discoloration and browning can occur. Bloom may, be, may seem to be faster, but it will have lower yields with fewer bud points or bud sites. Nitrogen tox toxicity. If the nitrogen levels are too high, leaves can show an unnaturally deep dark hue. This can be fixed with a decrease in nutrients or a quick flush over your plant container to remove the excess nutrients. Nitrogen, as I mentioned, is a mobile element, which means that when the plant senses nitrogen is low, it will remobilize nitrogen from the older leaves to the younger growth. I know I'm repeating myself a little bit, but some of those things I really want to get stuck in your guys' heads. So that's why I kind of put a few things in here a few times. Uh, that is why nitrogen deficiency symptomology of total leaf chlorosis or total yellowing initially appears on the older lower leaves. With advanced nutrient nitrogen deficiencies, the symptomology will work its way up the stem into the middle section of the plant, which will confuse the diagnosis. Meaning, if you're not looking at your plants every day and you walk in like three days after not looking at them and all of a sudden half the plant is yellow, you don't necessarily know where it started which is why we really want to take a look at our plan every single day, not just to see if it's watered, but to see how the leaves are looking. And I like to look all over the plant, a little bit underneath, a little bit up top, because sometimes the plants start to get really bushy and you may not notice these yellow leaves at the bottom right away, unless you're really looking for them. So that's what it's going to look like. That's more, um, the picture on the left is a little more early stage. Uh, middle stage really. And then the picture on the right is it's starting to really advance. Treating nitrogen deficiency. Many standard nutrients contain high levels of nitrogen and are usually a quick fix. Fish-based nutrients, not fish shit, but fish-based, meaning fish emulsion, fish powder, ground up fish, um, are often rich in nitrogen containing, how do you say that, Ami amines, amines, I don't even know. Check that your nutrient pH is okay. Consider a light foiler feed with a nitrogen rich nutrient. Now, anytime you have a deficiency, if you foiler feed, you will clear it up a lot faster, meaning mix it up into a squirt bottle, a spray bottle, and spray your leaves top and bottom. But if you're going to spray your leaves, always do that about a half hour before the lights shut off. You don't want to do that in the middle of the light cycle. Um, the light, you gotta remember that when you spray something on those leaves, every little water bubble becomes like a magnifying glass. So now you got a really strong light and it starts to burn your leaves. So that's why we wanna only spray down our leaves towards the end of the day. Uh, where was I? You can also consider using a seaweed uh, as a foiler spray also. Um, cannabis leaves can absorb small amounts of nutrients directly through the leaf surface, which is why making a foiler feed such, is such a great option. Phosphorus. Just like nitrogen, phosphorus, chemical symbol P, is a mobile macronutrient, which is essential to plant health and growth. It is used in the formation of plant proteins, plant DNA, and essential for proper photosynthesis to occur. And you can see from the picture there, picture on the right, how the outside of the leaf starts to yellow a little bit and the inside actually gets a little bit darker. That's a, a really common to what, it, what a phosphorus deficiency will look like. If you've ever seen any dry leaves or areas of brown discoloration, then you may well have seen a phosphorus deficiency yourself. It may also cause red purple coalations or dead spots in the leaf stems. The leaf may subsequently take on a dark green hue. If left unchecked, phosphorus deficiencies slows the vertical and horizontal growth significantly. Dark blackish spots can appear on leaves. Leaves can curl and drop, possibly showing hints of metallic purple or dark bronze appearance. To treat it, keep your pH nearer the acidic side, closer to six. So I would drop my pH just slightly if I have a phosphorus deficiency, which will help it uptake more phosphorus. Um, it'll just help make it bioavailable quicker and it'll increase how fast it can uptake it. Adding a phosphorus rich feed or fertilizer is recommended. You can use a fish meal or worm castings. 
those are a good organic alternative. Ensure your temperatures are in range. Cool temperatures seem to make it more difficult for effective phosphorus uptake. So phosphorus deficiency, we can raise that temperature a little bit. Ensure that you're also not overwatering. Um, to prevent it, use a good, good, rich medium that's rich in phosphorus. Basically, any of the soils in a good grow store. Um, to make the soil easier to grow, to grow in and easier to use, try using well aerated grow containers such as a fabric pot, which will allow better soil oxygenation levels. The use of beneficial mycorrhizae will also help with overall soil health. The microbes may also help convert less soluble phosphates into more soluble forms, which are easier for your cannabis plant to absorb and utilize. So another great reason for using mycorrhizae. Potassium. Alongside phosphorus and nitrogen, potassium, chemical symbol K, is the other main ma mobile macronutrient used by the cannabis plant. Potassium is vital for synthesis and transpiration of sugars and simple carbohydrates. Potassium is also required to enable transpiration, water uptake, as well as root growth and cell division. Potassium is also vital for the production of ATP, I don't even know how to say that, which is a measure of cellular energy. And this picture is going to show you a little bit of what it's going to look like. Sometimes it starts a little more in the middle of the plant but, or middle of the leaf, as you see on the left. But normally it's more on the edges and it'll start to get brown and, and die off on those edges. Which is very easy to, um, to misdiagnose because it looks like it's got a burn of some kind. So that could be when we start seeing the leaves doing what's on that right picture, we might want to think of that we've given it too much of something or it could be this deficiency. So again, I would probably first make sure my pH is on and then flush it out before I would handle this deficiency. You might see the leaf, uh, curling of the leaves as well as brown and yellow colors on leaf tips, and leaf edges. Your plants may stretch more than normal with a potassium deficiency. To treat it, some growers like to flush their medium, like I just said, to ensure that you're not dealing with other issues such as overfeeding, which again can interfere with potassium up uptake. Use a potassium rich nutrient feed or foiler feed. Organic seaweed is particularly useful as a foiler feed. Now you guys probably noticing in each of these, I'm giving you guys some options besides whatever nutrient line you're using, because I'm giving this to a lot of different people who might be using a lot of different nutrient lines. And there might be some people watching at home that are don't have the availability to go and find something high in potassium. So I'm going to always tell you something that you can find in any garden center. So if you're far from a, a grow store, at least you can get into a garden center, even a Home Depot, and you can always find um, some organic seaweed. You know, they sell that everywhere. You can always find some fish emulsion. Those are things that we can find anywhere and that they will work to fix these issues. Magnesium. Magnesium is chemical symbol Mg. It's an immobile micronutrient. It is essential for photosynthesis and it's used to make the vital chlorophyll pigment. Without magnesium, chlorophyll and photosynthesis won't work. As an immobile, mic as an immobile nutrient, any deficiencies tend to be seen in new growth of leaves. The leaves start to yellow, they start to show yellow spots, which eventually turn brown, causing leaves to die. Areas between the veins of older leaves turn yellow, intervenal chlorosis, and may also show rust-colored spots. If left untreated, magnesium deficiencies can seriously diminish a plant's ability to produce any type of harvest. And I'll show you what it looks like. You'll start seeing the yellowing on the middle of the veins, and that's that intervenal chlorosis. Now, there are a few deficiencies that start as intervenal chlorosis, so sometimes we got to look a little farther than that. Um, oh, let me go back, though. But you'll notice really starting down at the bottom and working its way up. If pH is outside the desired range, flush your grow medium with, with water, preferably at about 6, 6.1, 6.2, so we're going to take it just slightly down. Um, Epsom salts are often used to fix the problem. Try adding a teaspoon of Epsom salt to a liter of water and seeing how your plants respond to it. Some people benefit from water with naturally high levels of magnesium. So again, if you do that Google search and you're looking at your water, what's in my water, you might find, you might find that you're high in magnesium. 
or you might find that you're really low in magnesium and it's something you want to add more constant. Um, since I use an RO machine, I'm adding calcium and magnesium at least once a week, sometimes every feed. It just depends on the plant itself. To prevent a magnesium deficiency, um, I guess I'll just read it. As with all cannabis deficiencies, prevention is better than a cure. By the time you see the signs of magnesium deficiency, your plant might already have been feeling the effects for a month or so. So giving them that CalMac on a regular basis usually is pretty smart. Um, you won't hurt it by giving CalMag unless you're giving it constantly and it doesn't need it, but throwing it in as a once a week feed will should make your plants really happy and healthy. Um, you might want to include some powdered dolomite limestone mixed with your grow medium. Uh, this is magnesium rich and slowly breaks down, releasing magnesium for the roots to uptake. So if you are having CalMag problems constantly, it's, it's one thing you can do is add that. Uh, there's a new product by Nectar for the Gods called Chimera, which will be out within the next few weeks, which is basically a, a limestone that you can just add in a little bit. It will help keep those deficiencies down. Uh, well, there's always a CalMag rich nutrient available. Every line has one and every grower definitely wants to have some CalMag in the house, which will bring us to calcium. Calcium, chemical symbol CA, is an immobile macronutrient, but one which has an essential role in the plant structure. Calcium helps fortify the cell walls. Calcium deficiencies can therefore result in warped structure, a lack of structure to the new growth. Calcium will also help the flow of nitrogen and sugars throughout the plant. So a lot of nutrients actually help other nutrients do something. So when you don't have enough calcium, Sometimes we're going to see an, a, what starts to look like a nitrogen deficiency that's actually a calcium deficiency. Symptoms, the leaves, especially lower ones, can curl and take, an un, take on unusual shapes. You may also observe yellow brown spots. These can have brown borders and will grow over time as the problem continues. Root health is also damaged by calcium deficiencies. Root tips will slowly die. The result is a stunted plant that will struggle to recover in the worst cases. A calcium magnesium nutrient supplement is a fast and direct solution. Ensure your feed pH hasn't become too alkaline as in, and is in range. If you don't have a CalMag supplement, you can try adding a teaspoon of hydrated lime to around four liters of water and using this as your feed. A good way to prevent CalMag or calcium deficiency um, is to add some powdered dolomite lime to your grow. So that lime is gonna help Cal and Mag. So having that in there, it will slowly release. Next up is boron. Boron, chemical symbol B. It's used together with calcium to ensure healthy wall structures and effective cell division. Boron is an immobile macro macronutrient. It is required in very small amounts, so it's one of the less common cannabis nutrient deficiencies to see. Most good quality soils or compost contain sufficient boron. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen this deficiency ever. Um, I think I've seen just about all of them, but this one. Uh, but that is what it would look like if you do have it. If you reuse your, uh, your soil a bunch of times, that's something you're going to see. Uh, if you're in hydroponics, it's a possibility. A lack of boron will produce a plant that looks like it's wilting. The technical term is lack of turgor. turgor. Vegetative growth will be poor. New growth can appear twisted. The leaves can show a yellow brownish discoloration. To treat it, you want to flush your grow medium and add, a, add some extra boron. This is done by adding a teaspoon of boric acid to two to three or to three to four liters of water and feeding your plants. Copper. This is what copper is going to look like. Copper is uh, starts getting a little funky when those leaves start to twist to the sides. Copper chemical symbol CU is a macronutrient, which is semi-mobile, semi-mobile. Um, sometimes you'll see that in the new growth. Sometimes you'll see that in the old growth. Sometimes you'll see it in the middle of the plant more, more often. It helps to 
the plant to utilize nitrogen as well as assisting in the metabolism of carbohydrates. It is unusual to see genuine cases of copper deficiency. Most grow mediums and feeds have a sufficient copper, have sufficient copper for plant requirements. Symptoms, you will see slow wilting occurring. New growth can appear, twi can appear to twist and turn as it grows. Treating deficiencies of mobile macronutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is more straightforward than treating complicated deficiencies involving micronutrients of heavier metals such as molybdenum, iron, copper, etc. Getting the correct dosing required and the correct form of the mineral isn't always easy. So using that good quality soil is going to keep you away from having these issues. Iron. Chemical symbol Fe is a semi-mobile macronutrient. It is, a necess it is necessary for the use of nitrates and sulfates. Iron is also required for the production of chlorophyll. Iron deficiencies can occur if, if your pH is out of range. It also can be caused by too much zinc. So if for some reason you have too much zinc, not very common, um, but it can cause that deficiency. Uh, also too much magnesium or cop magnes or copper. So don't confuse that with magnesium. Magnes is different. Um, too much magnesium is not gonna cause that. All of these can interfere with iron uptake. Iron is an important mineral for processes involved in general metabolic, metabolic and energy forming processes. And that's what it would look like there. Uh, you notice that the leaf tips are staying darker and the centers are turning yellow. Symptoms. Symptoms of iron deficiency can initially appear in new plant growth. Intervenal chlorosis can appear at the base of new leaves. After this, the same symptoms can be seen through the leaves in, in older growth. Overall yellowing between the leaf veins is a good indicator of iron deficiencies. Intervenal chlorosis, often called chlorosis, can be caused by a deficiency of several micronutrients, iron, zinc, agnes, all of which the symptoms look similar. Yellowing of the leaves can, can be caused by a number of cultural or environmental issues also. Normally it's due to the pH of the soil being too high. Magnes, chemical symbol MN. It's an immobile micronutrient. It helps with, with several important cell functions, including nitrogen use, respiration, and photosynthesis. Root cell growth is aided by magnes, which also protects the roots from less useful bad microbes. It's unusual to see genuine, genuine cases of magnes deficiencies. Often it is related to too much iron or high pH. Um, we're going to just skip this slide on respiration. Symptoms, just like other immobile nutrient deficiencies, magnes deficiencies tend to show up as a pale discoloration near the base of the new plant. And I just say this, this can eventually spread out to affect the tips of leaves and, and brown necrotic, nec necrotic spots start to appear eventually on older leaves. The leaf margins and veins can appear green while the intervenal areas can start to yellow. Molydendum, this is the prettiest of all the deficiencies. Molydendum will start to make your leaves turn purple. So this is the one that always got me because at the end of your growth, when the plant starts to take everything out of the leaves, you've stopped feeding your plant, you're going through a couple weeks of flush, lots of times, especially with certain strains, we start to see the leaves start to really turn purple. But many times this is nothing more than a molydendum deficiency. Um, it's just, it's taking all the molly, molydendum out of the leaves and sending it out to the newest growth and to the buds. And then we're gonna start seeing this. Um, and at the end, nothing to be concerned with. You always gotta remember, cause we also have a lot of, a lot of students that reach out to us and they start asking us what's going on with my plant. But it's right at the end. So within those last couple of weeks, that's what your plant's going to do. It's going to show a ton of deficiencies. It's going to be sucking all these things out of the leaves to send it to the flowers. And it'll look like deficiencies, but that's just where the plant's supposed to be at the end. It's supposed to kill itself off, start dying off at the end. Uh, Melodendum, chemical symbol MO, is a mobile macronutrient. 
It is essential for the correct function of two important enzyme systems, which convert nitrates to ammonium compounds. Again, general, genuine deficiencies are rare and they're difficult to correct. General deficiencies are scarce. They can be exasperated by cold weather. So it's another time we see those purple leaves coming out is if you're outdoors and a, we get to that first frost, all of a sudden everything starts to turn purple. You might see yellowing of older leaves, which may also show intervenal chlorosis. The leaves may cup and curl upwards before twisting and dying. Most at risk are beginning hydroponics growers. You know, when you're new to hydroponics, you've got to be able to dial in what's in that water. You know, when we're in soil or a soilless medium, we don't have those issues because everything we need is within that soil uh, as far as those micro or macronutrients. Treatments, just flush, pH up. Um, if you do catch a molydendum deficiency early, um, it's all you really wanna do. Give it a cleansing flush with a medium with pure 6.0 to 6.3 water. The micronutrients the roots need are locked out and the excessive fertilizers need to be leached out. And then it should be able to take enough molydendum out of the actual soil that it's in. Uh, Step two is making sure that the pH is perfect per growing medium. So if you're normally in soil and it should be 6.3, 6.4, stay at 6.3, 6.4. Make sure that, that whatever you're using to check your pH is a decent working instrument. So if you're using a pH pen, make sure it's a good one. You know, Make sure that you're using reference solution that you are um, referencing that pH pen, meaning zeroing it out to 7.0, 4.0, 10.0, depending on your pen. Uh, kind of just said all that. Tips to avoiding molybdenum deficiencies. Use good soil. <laughs> That's the best tip I got. Make sure your pH pen is working. We just said that. Next, sulfur. Sulfur is a critical micronutrient. It's used for vital enzymes and protein, proteins. Sulfur is essential to plant, plant respiration as well as for synthesis or breakdown of fatty acids. It also plays an important role in the synthesis of oils and terpenes. Deficiencies in sulfur may be caused by the loss of phosphorus or due to the high pH levels in the root zone. So again, keep that pH on, everything kind of, one thing helps the next. So we'll, if our phosphorus, if our pH is off and our, which makes our phosphorus not uptake, we might start seeing a sulfur deficiency, which otherwise we wouldn't see. So pH, 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 I know I've said it a lot today, but really, really important pH, that nutrient solution before you water your, your plant. Symptoms, it's uncommon to see a sulfur deficiency, but if you have it, you might see young leaves turning lime green before turning yellow. You might observe stunted growth followed by graduate, gradual yellowing of leaf veins. Leaves may also be dry and brittle. Continued deficiency results in lower potency and inferior yields. That's kind of been throughout all of these, if you've heard me, it's what happens when we have a lot of deficiencies, inferior yields, we get a smaller plant. So it's another reason why we just want a healthy plant. Now, when you do see deficiencies, remember, like I've said, it's a weed, we can get it to come back, it's still gonna give you medicine, you're gonna get a yield, it's just gonna be probably a smaller yield. With sulfur deficiencies, the occurrence is much lower than say nitrogen, Sulfur and nitrogen deficiencies have very similar symptomology. The key is observing where on the plant the symptoms first appear. Sulfur is a partially mobile element. In most sulfur de deficiency situations, the symptoms of leaf yellowing will, will appear in the middle section of the plant. And if it's a nitrogen deficiency, it's mostly gonna appear at the bottom of the plant. Otherwise, it's gonna look very similar. Uh... This is the case when nitrogen is also amply provided. If at the same time, nitrogen levels are inadequate, sulfur deficiency symptomology can overlap in, in lower portions of the plant in the same region where the nitrogen symptomology will appear. That can make figuring it out kind of difficult. So keeping it on a really good feed schedule, using that good soil, and you won't see a lot of deficiencies at all. The fix for sulfur deficiency is easy, Epsom salts. You can apply them at a rate of one third an ounce per gallon of water. 
Plytus is a 5% to 10% flow through, meaning if we, however much we give, we want to see at least 5%, 10% come down the bottom. Uh, this will stop the symptom from progressing, but will not reverse the old leaf chlorosis or necrotic spotting. So you're not gonna see those leaves get better. You're just gonna see it stopping on new leaves. For regions that lack sufficient sulfur in your water, and sulfur is not part of the regular fertilization program, Epsom, you should apply some Epsom salts at a rate of 4.5 grams per gallon of water. Um, Mostly, at least in this area, you're not going to see that as an issue. And then we got zinc. Zinc, chemical symbol ZN. It's a metallic immobile micronutrient. It's important for the production of sugar and proteins. Zinc can also be used to make chlorophyll as well as for healthy stem growth. Deficiencies may be seen, especially where alkaline soils and dry climates are present. It may also be the result of acidic pH levels. Zinc is only required in small quantities, but is vital for the formation of cell membranes, proteins, and plant growth hormones. New leaves and plant growth tend to show intervenal chlorosis. The blades of the, of the cannabis leaf may look wrinkled. Uh, so you've heard me say intervenal chlorosis on some other deficiencies, but this is the only one where the, the leaf itself, you'll notice each intervenal chlorosis will wrinkle a little bit, it's gonna stick up. So it's gonna look like little tiny fingers sticking up. Uh, the leaf tips will discolor, they'll turn yellow and may show brown burnt burns at the tips. The leaves may also rotate 90%, 90 degrees sideways. That's what it looks like. It'll just work its way up the plant. Diagnosing common cannabis plant problems. The problem with emerging plant health is that they may be orchid that they can be easily confused and misidentified. Many deficiencies, for example, involve the leaves yellowing one way or another. Basically, all I'm saying is that many things look alike. So pay attention, pay attention where it is, pay attention daily. I am again repeating myself, but this is just really important for to have healthy plants. A grower that regularly experiences nutrient deficiencies when you're growing in a five gallon pot, go to a bigger pot, go to a 10 gallon, go to a 15 gallon, because what's gonna happen is a lot of these uh, micronutrients or macronutrients are already within that soil, like I said. So now if you have a bigger pot of soil, it's going to feed that plant longer. So you'll have less, less problems having these deficiencies. But you only really need to do that if you're having those problems grow after grow. Uh, Nectar for the Gods offers a highly recommended slow release organic nutrient, which, which produces great results and should prevent the risk of nutrient deficiencies. So a lot of people are starting to add a little bit. It's called one shot. You add a little bit in with your, with your soil and it'll give it a little bit of a slow release. It won't give it a, a bad taste like a miracle Grow or one of those other slow releases. This is specifically formulated for cannabis. Nutrient management is one of the key skills for any successful cannabis grower. Finding a grow method or system that works consistently well for you is one of the basics of cannabis growing. Likewise, finding a great nutrient line is vital. Fortunately, there's tons of them. There's a lot of really good systems out there. So figure out which system you wanna grow with for whichever reason and start learning that system. And it's gonna give you nice healthy plants. Remember that it's important to check the pH of your water when mixing nutrients after we mix them. It doesn't really matter what the pH is before we mix them. It matters what it is after we mix them. So that's really important. Most people don't think twice about the water that they use on their plants. If you can drink it, it must be fine. But the truth is there are things that can be in water that can be detrimental or at least make our plants a little sick and we may not notice it when we're drinking it. So knowing what's in your water is important. If you guys have a well, call in a company, ask them to come on in and sell you on a filter. I'm not saying buy a filter, I'm saying have them come in because what happens is they come in and they will test your water for you. They're gonna tell you what's in that water. 
So you'll know exactly what, what's in there. Um, you can also take your sample yourself, bring it into a lab, and they'll test it for you. It's usually, I don't know, 50, 75 bucks. It's not that expensive, and you know what's in your water. Um, and also remember, if you have city water, chances are you got really high chlorine. So just take that water, put it in a bucket, leave it out 24 hours so all that chlorine dissipates. So we're not giving your plants too much chlorine. Most important thing to remember is not to overwater. More people lose their plants by overwatering than underwatering. I would rather see you guys underwater. You can always give it a little more later, but when you overwater those plants, it, it can be very detrimental and a lot of people lose plants by doing it. Um, so remember the ways I taught you how to water. Do you have a question? Yeah. So the question is, I don't know if you can hear me at home. Uh, have you, have I ever heard of anybody using perlite underneath the pot, but in the saucer? So you can water from the bottom. Uh, I, I do know some people who bottom water. Um, I don't know anybody who, who uses perlite to do that. Um, the thing to remember is, especially if you're in a cloth pot, well, but what happens is then, you got to make sure that perlite might be a good one for that because perlite will dry out, but you want to make sure the bottom of that pot is dry. It's not sitting in any water because otherwise you'll get root, root rot and that'll be definitely detr detrimental to your plant. Um, but that is a way to do it. Um, other people, I know somebody who crushes up water bottles. He takes water bottles, he crushes them up, he puts them in the bottom of his pot itself. So when he waters one, the water sits down at the bottom or it gets... You know, it's got a place to sit around these, but then also it will uptake some of that water later. Now, I'm not saying I recommend doing it. I'm just saying I know someone who does it. I know other people who put rocks in the bottoms of their pots for the same reason. Um, I like to water my roots every day or every other day if I can't do every day. I want to make sure that that feed is getting to through the whole roots. Um, so I don't like to bottom water. Even house plants at home, I notice that when I drench them versus bottom water, they seem to be healthier. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but from my experience, you know, they always seem to be healthier. So now when I'm taking, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, so the question is about Nectar for the Gods, the one shot I was just talking about. So the, the brand is Nectar for the Gods. The product is called One Shot, and it is a slow release um, additive. Um, you mix that in with the soil. Mix it right in with the soil. I'm sorry? Uh, there is, I'd have to read the bag. I'm not sure what the ratio is. But I can read it after class. Is wet? What do you mean by that? The soils, I think you mean. Um, yeah, they're a little, they're a little moist. They'll hold moisture, and that's that's what you want. Yeah, they're great soils. So, um, yeah. So uh, the question is, can you clone when you have a deficiency? You don't want to clone a leaf that's having a deficiency. If you have a deficiency going on, so you're say it's a nitrogen. So the bottom of your plant's starting to turn yellow. You definitely could take a clone off the, off the new growth. That new growth has all the nitrogen being pumped into it. Now, if you have a immobile deficiency and you're seeing it in that new growth, probably not a good idea to take a, a clone because that clone probably won't make it. Yeah, you definitely want a, a healthy part of the plant to clone off of, but it might be smart to take a clone if you start seeing too many deficiencies because maybe you could save that strain where you might lose it if you're, if you're getting too far off with any deficiencies. 
there isn't any deficiency that you can't bring a plant back from. You know, there is always a way to bring that plant back unless it's gone way too far, unless you you've, haven't noticed it for too long. But as long as you're on top of it, you're looking at your plants every day, there's usually a way to bring that plant back. I mean, I've had some horrible deficiencies. You know, 22 years of growing, I've been through all of it. So between deficiencies, overwatering, underwatering, uh, heat, when I've come in and my room's been 99 degrees when the air went out. I mean, all kinds of things where I thought my plants were going to die. I think they've always come back. I mean, I don't think I've ever actually, I can't think of a plant where I've actually lost it. I've lost some babies and I've lost a few mothers in my life, but I've never lost a flowering plant. So usually a way to keep it, keep it going. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. Uh, okay. Well, that was all about deficiencies. So now we're going to get into bugs. Um, I think I mentioned this at the last class. I'm really big into law of attraction. So when you walk in your room, I'm going to show you what to look for. And every time you are looking at your plants, whether you're in your room, your tent, outside, whatever, you want to be looking and keeping an eye out for all these issues, whether it's deficiencies or bugs. But in your head, you should be thinking, I'm going to see my healthy plants. I'm looking to make sure my health plants are healthy. So you're thinking health, you're projecting health into your plants. You're not thinking bugs, nutrient deficiencies, problems, because when you go to look for problems, you're gonna find problems. When you go to look for healthy plants, you're gonna most likely find healthy plants. So just use your head to be thinking that way as you go. Bugs and pests love pot plants almost as much as I do, almost as much as you do. <laughs> Companion planting can help reduce the number of pests your cannabis plant will encounter. Successful cannabis cultivation requires more diligent attention. To protect your pot plants from pest damage, keep your eyes peeled for these common pests in your grows. Companion planting, I think we talked about that a little bit in the first class, um, just really means that you put something else near your cannabis plants. And so let's say you throw a uh, uh, marigold, little marigold plant, in your tent or next to your tent. Now, first of all, I would not recommend that you go to Home Depot and buy a plant and throw it in your tent with cannabis plants. You might be bringing bugs in. I don't recommend taking one of your house plants and putting it in with your cannabis plants. But if you do want a companion plant, start things from seeds. Um, so for instance, we start marigolds all the time here. You know, I like marigolds because I can pull the little seeds out of the old flower and the whole head is seeds. Just plant them again and you get some new marigolds. So if you throw a marigold plant, start with your seed, use a preventative, which we're gonna talk about preventatives in just a little bit for, for bugs. Use a preventative and now you've got a, a plant that you know has no, no insects whatsoever and you put it in your tent or next to your tent or in your room. Now what happens is, let's say you're out in your garden, a little white fly lands on you and you walk in, or just even being outside, you can have a little white fly on you. You walk into your tent and that white fly flies off, goes on your plant. About three weeks later, all of a sudden you got tons of white flies because it left some crawlers. The crawlers turned into flies and over time you, they're mating really fast. And now you see a bunch of them. So one of the ways we can help get rid of them is by taking that companion plant and stressing it out. So we can stress it out a lot of different ways. We can underwater it, overwater it, give it too much NPK, any of it, give it too little NPK, anything. Stress that one plant out. And now once it gets stressed and sick, the bugs are going to go to it. Bugs can, I don't know, they smell it. Somehow they know that that plant is the sick one. And then all of a sudden you can actually take the bugs out of your room with that sick plant and get rid of it. So that's companion planting. Um, Again, I don't recommend it unless you're having issues. If you're someone to constantly, maybe you're in and out of a garden, you constantly have issues, then maybe. Um, but it is a way that you can do it. Um, and I do know people who do it at every grow. A lot of them do it with just one extra cannabis plant. Now here in Illinois, we're limited. We got our five. So we don't really want to take one plant and leave it stressed out. Um, but there are people who do that in other states where you can have more, more plants. Spider mites. 
Luckily, I've never had any, but they are horrible. Spider mice can be identified by their characteristic appearance. They kind of look like little spiders. Small oval bugs with six to eight legs. Or by the damage that they cause by nibbling away at the chlorophyll, leaving little white or yellow spots in their wake. When you see them, it almost, when you first see the spots, they almost look metallic. And you'll start to see these little tiny, tiny dots. So when you see any tiny dots, it's the first thing I look for. And again, I'm not thinking spider mites. I'm thinking I'm looking for a healthy plant. But somewhere in the back of my head, I know when I see tiny dots, I'm kind of looking for spider mites. Um, they'll also spin webs to protect their offspring. So be on the lookout for silky string on the leaves or the buds. Spider mites are a common garden pest. It generally lives in the undersides of the plants, plant leaves, where they might spin protective silk webs to protect themselves against the elements and other predators. They're less than one millimeter, 0.04 of an inch in size, so they're tiny. They come in all different colors, red and black, brown. Those are the three most common, um, but some look a little bit yellow, uh, almost every color. Spider mice prefer hot, dry conditions and lay transparent eggs, which can hatch in as little as three days. Hatchlings are sexually mature in five days, and female mites can live up to two to four weeks, laying about 20 eggs per day. So when you start doing the math on that, they spread fast. And the problem is, is we don't see them. You know, you, you bring one in, you don't know it's there. You bring 10 in, you don't know they're there. All of a sudden, you got 100 of them, and you start to see them. And that 100 laying 20 eggs a day and popping quickly. That's a problem. Uh, plants do need chlorophyll to grow. So an excessive amount of spider mites chowing on chlorophyll can cause significant damage or even death to a cannabis plant. Spider mite webs are very sticky and difficult to remove, which could result in an impure harvest and a non-usable product. Some initial signs of spider mite infestation include tiny spots or stippling on the leaves uh, or the silky web surrounding the other sides of the plant leaves and branches. Larger colonies, can cause leaves to turn yellow, become limp, and eventually die off altogether. A large spider mite infestation can have a significant effect on the cannabis plant. By destroying the plant's leaves, they may stun its ability to grow and develop, eventually resulting in lower yields. Spider mites may also infect the surrounding area of the buds, which can affect their ability to develop and mature properly. Finally, a large enough colony can kill entire plants, although that's uncommon. Usually when people find a large colony of spider mites, get rid of the plant because it's not something you want. There are ways to get rid of the spider mites, but they're hard to get rid of. We do not recommend using a chemical pesticide on spider mites. In most cases, this will only make the matters worse by killing off other insects that prey on the mites. Also, spider mites are notoriously good at developing resistance to common pesticides. So we suggest using organic methods. We also recommend addressing the environmental factors first and then following up by pruning and washing your plants. Remember, spider mites like it hot and dry. So before you get started on any kind of countermeasure against the colony, try bringing down the temperature of your grow room. If possible, bring it down past 68 degrees Fahrenheit, but be careful not to damage your plants. Next, create some extra air circulation in your grow area. Spider mites hate windy conditions. I say keep it windy all the time. Lots of fans, plants always dancing. That way, if one spider mite were to come in on you, probably not going to stick around on the plants. It does not want to be in that windy environment. So when the plants are always moving, that spider mite doesn't want to be there. If we find them, we do want to prune and hose it down if we can. Now, if you got in outdoor plants, that's easy. We can get out there, cut out the bad parts, hose it down. But if we have an indoor plant, like me, that grows through a trellis nut, sometimes it's impossible. I couldn't, once I have buds, I can't take my plant outside. I'd probably kill the plant moving it. Um, if you're not using trellis netting or it's a smaller plant, much easier. You know, you can pull it outside. When I say hose it down, I don't mean sprinkle it with a light hose. I mean, Hold your thumb in front of that hose and get it as, as hard of water coming out as you can. You almost want to 
the plant to be laying down because you're hitting it with so much water. I mean, it, they're very sticky and getting them off your plant takes a lot, um, but it can be done. Uh, if you're only dealing with a small infestation, you can cut out the infected areas, get rid of the webbing and just discard that into trash. You know, if you're doing that though, don't cut it off and carry it through your house. Cut it off with a bag, put a baggie around it, cut it off, or cut it off and drop it right into a bag because just one is all it takes to go to the next part of the plant, lay 20 eggs a day, and before you know it, now you got them back again. Once you've pruned your plants, consider hosing them down. I wrote gently, but you really want to do it way harder than gently. Now, if you got buds on your plant, no, you do not want to blast it with water like that. It's just going to kill it. So just cut off that area. Um, there's no really saving it. Uh, you might want to hose them down periodically if you find that you're dealing with mites on a regular basis. Once you've done all that, you might want to use one of the following control methods to minimize the risk of future infestation. Remember to check on your plants daily and repeat treatment at least twice to avoid having the mites come back. A lot of products are actually like five times, six times before they, you know, they want you to use it because that's the way to control them better. Uh, you can introduce other insects, predatory insects such as ladybugs, lace wings, and predatory mites will all prey on spider mites. They're generally available commercially, depending on the time of the year. So right now, you cannot find ladybugs anywhere. Nobody's got them. Every every company's out of them. Um, so very hard to find right now. Um, lace wings, that's something you can always find because you buy them in, uh, in the larva stage. They're dry. You add a little water to them and they come alive and they'll go and they'll, they'll eat all the spider mites. Now me, I don't really wish, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, lace wings fly. So they go from one, one, part of the plant or one plant to another. So if you do add to your room ladybugs or lace wings, they will eat everything. If there's no more food, they're just gonna die off. So they're both a little bigger, so you can kind of shake them off the plant. They're not gonna be all over your plants. So they are something you can add. Now, if you've got your cannabis plant in the middle of your living room, like some people do, I don't really think you wanna add a bunch of these bugs to your house. Um, so you wanna think about where you have them in your environment you're giving them. Uh, organic insecticides and insecticidal soap. There are a number of organic insecticides on the market that can help control spider mite infestation. Some of the more popular solutions that we recommend, one is Nucum. Nucum is uh, made from a food grade ingredient. It can kill mites in the, in the egg larvae or adult stage and doesn't leave any residue on the, on the plant. Insecticidal soaps are great for spot treating infested areas of your plants. They leave very little residue on your plants, but you should be able to avoid getting them directly on your buds. Multiple treatments might be necessary as soaps do not stay active for long. Essential and horticultural oils. This is more the path that I like to go down when I've had problems. Um, neem oil is one. It's made from the neem plants, it's all natural. Excuse me. Uh, you can also use eucalyptus oil, cinnamon oil, lemon oil, peppermint oil, rosemary oil. They're in a lot of these products you see out here in front of you. Um, some people have even, I've heard of them using vegetable oil, like canola, soybean, or cottonseed, although I haven't tried it, so I can't really recommend it without trying it. Um, let me get up for a second. This line is one of the lines that I use. Uh, I recently had white fly infestation and I started using this. This is SNS 209, Sierra Natural Sciences. Sierra, yeah, natural science. Uh, so when I had white flies, I used, now when I, well, let me actually tell the story real quick. So my white flies, I had a very bad infestation. I did notice I had a few little white flies and I did not get on top of it very fast. I waited probably five days. And within that five days, my little infestation or what I thought was a little infestation got much bigger. Um, 
So I finally started using this SNS 209. I put this in as a root drench. Used a little. This makes about 64 gallons or something. This little thing. So I made up my first couple gallons and I gave it to all my plants. And this is rosemary oil. It's really all this is: rosemary oil and some carriers. And what happens is the plant uptakes the rosemary oil. The white flies go to feed on it. They don't like that flavor. Me and you, we can't taste it. Uh, you could use this. I now use. I actually use this as a preventative now, every two weeks in my plants. Um, and it works great as a preventative. And it worked really good to get rid of my white flies for about a week. And after about a week, the white flies, the little crawlers as they call them they opened up and they started flying around the room again uh maybe about three weeks and after about three weeks of using this and it really didn't have it under control i went to the next thing which for me was azimax which i have down here too somewhere azimax is a whole bunch of different oils mixed together it's a little stronger so i used azimax same thing Used it. All my white flies gone by the next day, just like the SNS. And that lasted maybe a week longer than the SNS. Now, the Azimax, I know I don't want to use more than about twice in a grow because I will get a little flavor to the pot and I don't want any flavor. Um, so then I went to my third thing. I just stepped, kept stepping it up. And I used Dr. Doom, Total Release Fogger, which is a Perithians. And I used this and once again, everything dead. Again, didn't see anything in my room for the whole time until the day I was ready to take my plants down. And, and I was looking every day. So they were there, I just didn't see them. Um, and the day I went to take my buds down, I saw a couple fly in the room. Sometimes they're really small and you think it's a speck of dust, so they're hard to see. And I grabbed the bud and went like this, and about 20 of them came out. And that was the day I learned about washing your buds, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, and when I took down my plants, I actually did wash my plants, which got killed off everything. Um, I kept using this on my moms and babies, the SNS 209, which since then I haven't seen any more white flies, thank God. Uh, but as a preventative, it works great. Once we have any kind of infestation, they are very hard to get rid of. Um, I know a grower who comes in here who has had thrips. He said for years, he cleans out his tent, cleans out his room, bombs his whole house. He always has thrips. Now, I haven't actually been to his house or seen his plants or anything, but I've heard his stories that has been going on for years, which means they're just getting in somewhere and he's not killing them off enough. Um, so using a preventative, I, I think it's really important. I didn't do it for many years. Um, over 22 years, actually, the only thing I ever had before this, this white fly time was uh, fungus gnats. And I got fungus gnats from the soil that I brought in. I bought some soil outside at a garden center. They've been sitting outside and it had the larva from the fungus gnats. Um, so I've been pretty lucky. But every most growers I know have dealt with more Spider mites, I hear a lot. That's one I hear a lot about. Um, so for me, I'm very cautious. When I walk into my grow room, I never free my shoes because my shoes, I've been outside and I don't know if I've walked through some spider mites and there's one that hitched a ride, I don't want to bring them in. So I change my shoes. When I go in my grow room, I wash my hands and my arms really good before I go near my plants. You know, I try to be as cautious as I can. Um, here at the store, we have the tomatoes and stuff outside. I will not go play with them if I have to go in my room. I will just, I don't even want to touch another plant until I'm done with my cannabis room. Uh, if there is a day where I'm mowing the lawn or something, I'll, I go shower before I'll get in my, in my room. You know, I'm re really cautious as you guys all should be, because we really, you just don't want to bring any of these things in. Uh, getting rid of spider mites. Well, we just kind of talked about that. Actually, with spider mites, there's a great one. There's a few, and they're all good. Dr. Doom is a spider mite knockout, specific for spider mites. 
SNS, the Sierra, ne Sierra Natural Science. I always say it wrong. Uh, they also make one that's specific for spider mite control, although the SNS will actually keep them from coming in the first place. But if we have them, this is one way to really knock them out. Um, put everything here on the table. There's a whole bunch. They're all good products. Everything we carry is organic, as I mentioned. You know, you never want to go pick up some real bad poisons because, like I said, all of the bugs we're going to talk about, they'll become immune to those things pretty fast. Uh, let's see, we already talked about that. All right, aphids. The term aphid is used to refer to a group of small sap sucking insects that count as one of the most destructive pests on cultivated plants. They are huge around here. We see them on all the trees we have. They're everywhere in Illinois. Um, aphids can vary in size from roughly one to 10 millimeters. They can be green, black, red, or white in color. The most common kind of aphid is found in, is, that is found in home gardens are usually green and about one millimeter long. Mostly what we see around here is green or yellow. Winged female aphids usually hatch at the beginning of the spring and give birth to, to more female nymphs. Within a few weeks, these nymphs give birth to more young. The process is repeated several times, allowing the aphid numbers to rise dramatically in a short amount of time. By the end of the summer, aphids develop sexual forms. They'll become male and female, and then they'll mate to produce overwintering eggs. Most aphids, except for, the sex, except for the sexual forms, do not need a mate in order to reproduce and are able to produce live young, which is why they spread so fast. There are over 4,000 aphid species found around the world. While some aphid species are capable of developing wings, they produce quickly. Females may give live birth as often as 12 times per day, which is why we see those numbers come up really fast. So this is what it's gonna look like. You're gonna see them on the bottom of your leaves. So again, this is why I look underneath as I'm searching for my healthy plants, but I'm actually looking at those bottom of the leaves, looking for the spider mite. Are there webs? Looking for aphids? Are there little tiny, little tiny things stuck to my leaves? You know, we're looking for all of those things as we just look, but really we're looking for just healthy leaves. That's what we wanna look for. Problems caused by aphids. Aphids not only eat the cannabis plant, but they shit all over it. And what happens is when they shit on their plant, the ants are attracted to the shit. So sometimes you notice ants coming in your room, start looking for aphids. Um, there's a chance you have, or white flies. They both will leave a residue, which can cause it. Uh, they've also been known to introduce viruses from other nearby plants. So if you have one plant that has like tobacco mosaic disease, they can spread that to another plant. So we want to Again, just prevention is better than cure. And you notice from that picture how different they all look. They're all considered aphids, but they're, they're quite different, some of these bugs. Aphids can usually be seen on the leaves and stems of the cannabis plant. Green varieties might be harder to spot. They, are especially, they especially like hiding on the underside of the leaves away from direct sunlight or sight. Aphids feed by sucking sap from the plants, leaving behind a thick, sticky substance called honeydew. Now, the honeydew can also cause problems. It eventually will get moldy. It'll turn like little black moldy spots. Uh, you'll notice that towards the, the fall around here, all of our leaves, actually the last few years have been getting worse, where the leaves of a lot of the trees start getting those big black spots. That's caused by, by aphids. Uh, the honeydew will also attract ants, which, which may protect aphids from any predatory insects, but thereby make, it an, make the infestation even worse. When feeding, aphids can cause leaves to curl, wilt, or yellow, and they will stunt the plant growth. Aphids are capable of transmitting diseases, which they will pass on when they feed on new plants. Mother Nature can help keep an outdoor aphid infestation in check with beneficial pests like ladybugs or parasitic wasps. Indoors, we can also introduce these beneficial predators. Ladybugs or praying mantises are a good one. Uh, also beneficial nematodes. Small aphid populations are usually not a big concern. However, aphids are able to reproduce extremely quickly and large infestations can have a huge impact on the health of your cannabis plants and their ability to develop. 
Aphids are introduced into gardens by weaned colonizers, which quickly lay eggs on new plants they wish to colonize. While it's always best to prevent a pest infestation and control one, aphids can be particularly hard to prepare against. Outdoor gardens are usually more at risk of aphid infestations. As we mentioned earlier, weaned female aphids are usually hatch in the spring, while new female and male aphids usually lay over wintering eggs at the end of summer. If you want to protect your garden against any kind of pest infestation, it is always better to ensure that your grow environment isn't attractive to pests. Most gardens like most garden pests like warm, humid conditions and stagnant air. Therefore, it's always important to ensure that your grow room is kept at the right temperature between 65 and 80. If you if you should install a few you uh, you should install a few fans or ventilation systems to ensure plenty of airflow airflow can't talk today however to best however to best protect against the infestation try some of the following tips and keep an extra eye out for aphids during the spring and late summer prune and clean any infected areas if you spot aphids on your plants a good first step to dealing with the infestation is to prune off any infected areas and dispose of them immediately so if you see them on the bottom of a leaf pluck those leaves off, get rid of it. If you see it on a couple leaves that are on the same stem, cut the stem off, take off that whole part of the plant, get rid of it. Once you prune the plant, you also want to hose them down with water if you can, or with a water vinegar solution that will kill off any remaining insects. Now, if you're gonna do that, very light on the vinegar. You can also introduce predatory insects, ladybugs, harbor fly larvae, parasitic wasps, Aphid midge larvae, crab spiders, and lacewings are all natural prey of aphids and many other pests, such as spider mites and white flies. We recommend introducing some of these insects into your garden during spring and late summer to best prevent an infestation. An outdoor garden. An indoor garden, I don't really recommend that. If you've already detected aphids on your plants, it's usually too late to rely on predatory insects. Instead, follow some of the other tips below. Once you've dealt with an infestation, reintroduce predatory insects into your garden to prevent other infestations in the future. As with any other garden pests, we recommend staying away from chemical pesticides as they usually aren't safe on the cannabis plants. Instead, try some of using some of these options. Organic essential oils are recommended to have on hand for any infestation. Insecticidal soaps are, idea for, are ideal for spot treating infected plants. They can take care of most regular garden pests like spider mites and white flies, but shouldn't be applied directly to any cannabis buds. We suggest using insecticidal soaps at least twice to ensure you're completely removed all aphids on your plants. So depending on what you're using, like I just said, the insecticidal soaps, they say at least twice. If you have uh, white flies or spider mites or aphids or anything and you're using the SNS 209, it tells you use it five waterings in a row. Do that. I just told you my story about my white flies and I had to go from this to this to this. Part of my problem was I did this three times and thought I got rid of them. I thought I knew better than what it says on here. So I didn't do the five times. So follow the directions, do what it says. And hopefully I will get rid of any problems you have. Yes. Is, I'm sorry, Doc, is that one I have up here? No, oh, you're talking about, oh, no, I, that's really hard to hear you. So I, I think you said Dr. Bonner's, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. So I'd have to, I can look it up after class if you want me to though and tell you. Um, there's a lot on the market and a lot more coming out. We have a new product that we're gonna be carrying really soon. I can't remember the name of it, um, but it's a citric acid and it works really well. You can spray your plant down with it, your flowers, your, your leaves, everything. Uh, white flies, they have had 100% success with one treatment. Uh, spider mites, I think it was like 85%. So basically two treatments and you get rid of them. So, and there's a lot more new stuff coming out. Again, as more, universities are studying up on cannabis, they're testing things like this. You know, how do we get rid of all these bugs? What works, what doesn't? So there's a lot more science going into 
cannabis industry into the whole industry now. Uh, let's see, where was I? Treating your cannabis plants with oils. Some gardeners swear by using horticultural or essential oils to treat garden pests like aphids. Neem oil is very commonly used in pest pr protection, but there are a variety of other oils that can do the trick as well, including eucalyptus, rosemary, lemon, and cinnamon oil. Simply mix any of these oils with water and apply them evenly to your plants with a mister. So you can do this with just natural oil too. If, you're, if you cannot get your hands on any of the products, you can always order some oil and mix up your own. Uh, alternatively, you may also want to treat your plants regularly with horticultural oils. Like I said, I use the rosemary oil now every two weeks. White flies, my nemesis. White fly is a common garden pest that affects a variety of plants, including cannabis and tomatoes. I'm sure that's how I got mine, was it came in with my tomatoes last year. They behave very similar to spider mice, and they're usually found on the underside of leaves where they steal essential nutrients from the plant. White flies look like tiny white moths with yellow bodies and are roughly two millimeters long. Adult flies are usually found on the top part of the plants, while nymphs are usually found lower down. White flies usually lay eggs on the underside of the leaves. Eggs are usually grayish or yellow and feature a cone-like shape. Adult white flies can lay up to, ready, 400 eggs, which usually hatch within a week. That's why they're so hard to control once you do have them. Eggs hatch into a flattened nymph, often called crawlers, which feed on the plant for about a month before developing into adult white flies. Adult flies live for roughly four weeks. Now, unless you've got a really high powered microscope, you're not gonna find the crawlers and the nymphs. You will see the flies when they are actually flying in the room a little bit. Um, I highly recommend that everybody takes a yellow sticky trap and a blue sticky trap and hang it in your grow room or your tent. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. Like these are five packs. These are seven bucks. These are six bucks. But that's for five of them. And you only need one of each in your grow, really. Unless you got a huge grow room. Um, but yeah, in my room, I just I put one, one on one side, one on the other, kind of half in the middle, hanging between my lights. Um, and what happens is like white flies, they're gonna be attracted to that yellow. So it's another thing that I look at when I go in my room. I just take a quick peek. These, they open up and you get like a little grid and are really sticky. So a fly gets near there, they're attracted to it, they stick. You know you got white flies much faster than you do if you don't aren't looking at these. Um, yellow, really good for things like uh, 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 thrips looking right at it. Thrips, leaf miners, and other things. So um, even a regular bug that flies in your room, if a fly gets in, for instance, you just heard me say the word leaf miner. We'll get to leaf miners in just a bit. But leaf miners are the larva from normal bugs like beetles and flies that might get into your room and just lay some larva. They're not the normal cannabis loving bugs but the larva itself will still eat away at your leaves. So that's why we want to know they're in the room. So having these sticky traps, if a fly gets in, it's going to get on one of those traps probably. And one, at least I'm going to catch the fly before it keeps laying larva, but also I'm going to know to start looking for leaf miners. Um, white flies are relatively easy to spot. Adult flies are usually found flying around the plant or are grouped on the underside of leaves. Shaking a plant will cause the adult flies to fly away, making them easier to see. So once I knew I had them, when I was kept looking for them, I would go in and just kind of take my hand and brush over the plants or grab onto my trellis net, give it a good shake, which makes all my plants shake, and I'd just see the flies fly out. That's one of the ways to look for them. Uh, when feeding, where am I? Eggs are normally deposited in circular groups, roughly 30 to 40, can be found on the underside of the leaves. When feeding, white flies puncture the leaves of the plant in order to suck nutrients from them. This leaves white spots on the top side of the leaves, which is yet another clear sign that your plant is infected. Even if you can't directly spot any flies on your plant, 
large populations can cause leaves to become yellow or die off completely. White flies usually consume more plant nutrients than they can digest. They excrete these excess nutrients in a sweet, sticky substance known as honeydew, just like the aphids. If your plants are infested with white flies, keep an eye out for honeydew on the leaves of your plants, as it will act as a growth medium for a black sooty mold that can hinder the plant's ability to, to do photosynthesis. Honeydew will also attract ants, which is why I said if you see ants, you're looking for either white flies or aphids, which can further interfere with the presence of other natural white fly predators, potentially worsening the situation in your, in your grow room. As with any pest, it is always better to take preventative measures against white flies to begin with. It's always harder to get rid of a pest than to prevent one. And white flies can be particularly tricky to manage in large populations, which don't take long to form. Like when dealing with spider mites, we suggest you address any environmental factors that might be causing your infestation first, then follow up by hosing down and pruning your plants. Once you've addressed the environmental factors that might be contributing to your white fly problem, it's time to prune any infected leaves. Make sure you discard any prunings immediately to avoid infecting other plants. You might wanna try hosing down your plants, again, if you can get them outside. However, white fly eggs are notoriously hard to remove from plants and might require a decent bit of water pressure, which could damage your plants. Next, we recommend you some of the following techniques for removing white flies. Predatory insects. Ladybugs, lacewings, and predatory mites all prey on white flies and their eggs. If you haven't already, we highly suggest introducing the in insects to your grow environment, again, if you're outside. Insecticidal soaps. These are great for spot treating infected areas of your plant. Try not to get them directly on any buds and consider using them multiple times to ensure you're killing off all the flies in your grow area. Now, the problem with that is since you can't use insecticidal soaps on the buds themselves and the flies themselves, they will go right inside the bud. They'll start eating away at the leaves within the bud itself, which makes it a little harder, which is why I prefer the, the oils for that. Because like I said, that oil gets uptaken by the plant itself. When the bug goes to take up a, a chomp and you start eating it, it's not gonna like the way it tastes. And it just wants to go away. Uh, essential and horticultural oils are becoming increasingly popular as a way to control and prevent pests. Neem oil is one of the most common essential oils used on cannabis and other plants, but there are others which, you may, which may also do the trick. Besides neem oil, you might want to try eucalyptus, rosemary, lemon, and cinnamon oil. Simply mix them together with water and apply them to your, pet, to your plants using a mister, trying not to get it on the buds. Now, I do like the fact that I can use some of these as a retrench instead of spraying my plants down. Because once I have buds, I don't really want to spray them. Um, the citric acid that I was just talking about, that new product that we'll be getting in, you can spray your buds. Uh, it will make them look not quite as pretty. They'll get a little bit weird looking, but they'll still be great medicine. So it is one that you can use to spray your buds. So I'm excited to get that one in. Um, you guys noticing a pattern? All of these bugs, they're the same. They spread a lot, meaning they multiply quickly. They lay a lot of eggs or larvae. All of them, essential oils will help the problem. All of them having more fans, more airflow will help the problem. So it's really the same kind of for every bug, just the bugs are a little different. Thrips. Thrips are a common threat to cannabis cultivators also. They are small pests that look like little worms or flying insects. They're tough to get rid of and survive by sucking the sap out of your plants. Thrips are a common problem faced by cultivators. They are a minute pest that literally sucks the sap out of your plants, yeah, the sap out of your crop. Thrips come in several different species. They can be tiny winged insects measuring in the millimeters, or they can look like small pale worms. Regardless of their species, thrips are a nuisance to farmers everywhere. They can reproduce up to 12 times per year, not quite as bad as some of the others. When mature, they can survive just by flying from one plant to another. Outside of cannabis, thrips' favorite crops seem to be cotton, although they can damage many other crops. 
but they really seem to love cannabis. Unfortunately, they are particularly damaging when they appear early in the grow process. The most damaging thrip threat to cannabis comes from a species called Frankinella. These thrips are yellowish white flying bugs. They lay their eggs on the plant itself. The first signs of their presence are small silver stains and dots on the underside of the leaves. This is how thrips lay their eggs. They also are easy to miss. Worse, while not a significant threat to outdoor growers, they thrive inside. Indoor growers and greenhouses are their favorite environments. They love high temperatures. Thrips can also be present if not treated properly, but can also be persistent if not treated properly. And if not eliminated early, they can significantly reduce yields. So again, I'm repeating myself, one bug to the next, it's kind of the same story. Lower yields, so we don't want them. Best way to rid yourself of thrips is to never have an infestation in the first place. I don't know why I wrote that for every one of these bugs. And I don't even know where I came up with that from. Of course, it's better to not have it in the first place. Nobody wants a pest infestation. So make sure to you thoroughly sanitize your growing space before you begin. And also in between grows. Clean, clean, clean. Remember what I taught you guys the last or two classes ago. You have dead leaf material that sits there. Bugs can smell it. They smell that rotting material. They come for it. So keep it clean. Clean out the dead leaves. Pick them off your plant. Throw them away. Flush them down the toilet. Whatever you got to do, get them out of that grow room or out of your tent. Uh, and then fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are like tiny little dark short-lived gnats that look like small flies. Uh, very similar to fungus gnats are fruit flies. And fruit flies will act exactly the same way. So if you bring in fruit flies on your fruit, which a lot of us do this time of year going to grocery store, be careful may put a fruit fly trap in your kitchen if you get them, so you get rid of them right away because once they're in your cannabis plant, they will be hard to get rid of. Um, normally though, we get fungus gnats in the soil that we use. We bring it in, in the soil there is uh, larva in almost all bags of soil when you go with real, not the stuff we carry, this is, remember I told you it's uh, sterilized. So every larva has been killed. Um, but the larva does live in a lot of soil. So if you're just going for a regular dirt or soil, you'll definitely gonna have some fungus gnat larva. This is one of my favorite products. I think we talked about this before, the SNS SLF 100. Um, I use this to keep my roots clean and to help break down my nutrients. So I'm using this anyway. But the other neat thing this does is it eats the larva for fungus gnats. There's a bacteria in there that actually eats them. So that's kind of neat. Uh, fortunately, fungus gnats are not the worst pest you can encounter. If you have mature plants with a strong root system, fungus gnats will be more of a nuisance than a catastrophe. But on the other hand, they can pose a serious threat to young plants and seedlings. A massive infestation left unattended can be, unattended can be a problem for bigger plants. Fungus gnats are almost always an indication of moist conditions in your grow room. And usually occur in cannabis plants are being overwatered. So when we see fungus plants, one of the things we can do is slow down our watering, let our plants dry out more. Um, the larva will not survive if there isn't enough moisture within the plant itself. Now we don't wanna dry it out till we're killing our roots, um, but we do wanna dry it out enough to kill those fungus gnats. Fungus gnats, like to eat the roots and they can really, really uh, uh, affect that plant in a negative way by doing so. Life cycle, fungus gnats develop in four stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. In favorable warm and wet conditions, adult females deposit hundreds of eggs in the soil. Larva feed for about two weeks and then pupate near the soil surface. After three to seven days in the pupal stage, adult gnats emerge and live for about eight days. It takes about three to four weeks for adult gnats to develop from eggs. As fungal spores are around us everywhere, pretty much all the time, all gnats need are wet conditions and organic matter to appear. So they can be actually on fungal spores, the larva. So there are other ways we can get them. 
Many times our eggs are already included in unsterilized store-bought soil. Fungus gnats don't consider the roots of your can. Don't consider roots of your cannabis plants as their favorite food. What? They do. I don't know how you wrote don't. They will consider. I need to change that. Your roots as their favorite food. So we want to get rid of them very fast if we have them. Uh, but they'll also eat up any fungus and decaying matter in the soil. They do become a problem when organic matter in the soil gets depleted. In that case, they will devour on the root hairs and the tender cannabis roots themselves. When roots are damaged, plants can show various signs of disease, including yellow leaves, wilting, spotting, and drooping. Symptoms of nutrient deficiencies can occur. Sickly growth, leaf discoloration, despite your pH being on. So now we can look and say, wow, it looks like I got a nitrogen deficiency. So we check our pH, but our pH is on could be fungus gnats. So we want to be watching for that. They're pretty easy to spot though. Fungus gnats, they lay, like I said, they lay their larva in the soil and you will see them flying in and out, the, usually the sides right next to the side of your pot. You'll see them going in and out where they're going down there, laying out their more larva and coming back out or eating stuff and coming back out. Uh, seedlings will become weak, they'll fall over and die. Stunted growth and low yields is a classic symptom of fungus gnats, excuse me. Fungus gnat infestation is relatively easy to diagnose. They're small, but you'll see them if you get close to your plants. Uh, they look like tiny flies crawling, jumping in the soil or flying in and out. Sometimes you'll notice white maggots wiggling in the soil. Uh, that is the babies. Not as easy to spot because um, they're pretty tiny, uh, but you can notice them. Otherwise, unexplained plant issues, including, but not limited to, pale leaves, spots, brown edges on leaves, and drooping plants. So any of these issues, we start looking to see what it could be. How to eliminate fungus gnats from the cannabis plant. Fungus gnats do alert you to issues with your watering. When they appear, it's almost always because your plants are being overwatered. Fortunately, getting rid of them is relatively easy. Water less frequently. First and most important thing you should do is rethink your watering routine. Allow the soil to dry out fully between waterings as it will be fine. Most of the time, if you do that, the fungus gnat problem will go away on its own. Use yellow sticky traps. Posi position them around so that you'll know you got fungus gnats quickly. Um, and sometimes it'll actually attract almost all the fungus gnats right to it. Neem oil. If you have a pest infestation, you can use neem oil. Uh, works pretty good. Now also fungus gnats is the only thing we could use diatomaceous earth for. So if you put a little diatomaceous earth around your, on top of the soil or right around your, on the corners of your pot, if they crawl over that, it'll just rip them apart, and they'll die. Uh, blowing more air right on the soil itself will keep them from going in and out to lay more eggs. Uh, and then the BT bacteria, that's what is in this stuff, the SLF 100. So using that on a regular basis, like I use that every two weeks. I use that every week, sorry. Um, and uh, I should never have fungus gnats using that. Uh, let's see. Oh, another thing you can do, cover the soil. So when I had them really bad, I went and I took a bunch of play sand, you know, from Menards. And I brought it in my house and I boiled a bunch of water first. I put the play sand in a strainer and I put boiling water through it so it was nice and clean. And then I just put about a half inch of sand on the whole top of my pot. And when you do that, even for house plants, it's a great way to get rid of fungus gnats. Once you have that on there, the gnats can't go in and out. So it'll kill any larva that's in there and it'll stop any adults from going back in to lay more, more eggs. Uh, sterilizing your soil. Definitely something you can do if you're going to reuse, but I wouldn't. And we're going to move on to leaf miners. So leaf miners, as I mentioned, those are the babies from normal bugs, flies, beetles, things that you wouldn't normally see that won't really hurt your plants. They're not going to go in there and eat your buds. But in the baby stage, they will actually crawl inside your leaves. And as you can see from the 
uh, pictures, the one on the right, see how it looks like a little tiny uh, trail. And that's what it is. They're inside the leaf and they're actually eating their way through. That's why I could call them leaf miners. They're mining their way through by eating all that good stuff. As their name suggests, leaf miners tunnel into the tissue of the leaves. They chew their way through the vegetation, leaving a visible feeding tunnel behind them. Leaf miners are the larval stage of numerous species of insects, including many moths, soft flies, wasps, and beetles. Each of these species goes through four major phases of the life cycle, egg, larva, pupae, and adult. It is during the hungry larval stage where they inflict damage through mining leaves. Leaf miners select selectively target tissues within the leaves, as opposed to munching on the surface for several reasons. First, chomping through the inside of the leaf fills their bellies and creates a safe haven for and a place for them to hide from predators. Secondly, they specifically target juicier tissues with less cellulose, a fibrous structural component within the plant tissue. It just makes it easier for them to eat. Uh, very effective for larvae, the survival mechanism takes a heavy toll on plants. An aggressive leaf miner invasion can cause significant damage to leaves and affect plants and growth and yield. So now, if I have a yellow sticky trap and I look and there's a beetle on there and I've caught it early enough, I can start looking around and I might find that I have one leaf that has leaf miners and that's it. So I can pull that leaf off, use something like a neem oil on the rest of my leaves just to, in case there's anything in those other leaves and my infestation is gone. So that's another reason why I have no sticky traps. It's really important. Uh, upon hatching, the young larvae start to bore tunnels and leaves as they satiate, satiate, how do you say that? Satiate their hunger. Eventually, if they survive the throes of early life, the larvae morph into pupae and eventually into an adult insect. When a male and female wasp, beetle, moth, or sawfly mate, they contribute to the genetic components of the next wave of leaf miners. Although all of these species play important roles in the ecosystem, the key to, prevent, to preventing leaf miner damage lies in disrupting the, product, the productive cycle. Leaf miner tunnels look like trails that spiral, turn, and twist through the interior of the leaf, <coughs> leaving visible markings on the surface. At first glance, these markings appear worm-like, leading many gardeners to, to lay the blame on some sort of a parasite. In reality, they are actually the telltale signs of much smaller organisms. After spotting the obvious presence of leaf miners, you need to take action before these hungry fellows cause any more damage. Cannabis growers have a range of options at their disposal when dealing with these pests. Of course, you can reach out for a bottle of a chemical pesticide to put an immediate halt to the advance. Although effective pesticides can leave residue on flowers and cause environmental damage in the garden and beyond, so don't do it. Um, organic methods enable growers to tackle issues while preventing the delicate balance of their garden's ecosystem and keeping their prized flowers free from contaminants. So with leaf miners, neem oil is really the first go-to little neem oil on your leaves. The neem oil actually penetrates through the leaf and will kill the miners dead in their tracks. Uh, you can mix one teaspoon of neem oil per liter of warm water inside a mister. Add five drops of a suffocant to allow the oil and mixture to mix. Or you can just go and buy, where's my neem oil? Neem oil like this, it's already pre-mixed. And we got no issues. Uh, spray down your leaves, top and bottom. It'll kill off everything that's in there. Uh, sticky traps we talked about. Uh, okay, we're gonna skip. Uh, questions? Yes. Correct. Uh, if you're using a lot of neem oil, yeah, you need to um, flush your plant really, really well. Uh, too much neem oil will cause a flavor. Remember I was talking about Azimax, if we use that more than a couple of times, it starts to cause a flavor. It's because neem oil is in there. So anytime we're using neem oil, you definitely want to flush your plant good. And you don't want to use it over and over again. 
But if you have an infestation, using it once, using it twice is not going to cause a problem. Just flush your plant really well afterwards. And we all should be flushing our plant those last couple of weeks anyway, which flushes out all these toxicities. So we get rid of them all. So that really, that's it. We went through all the bugs. Um, there are other bugs that can affect cannabis plants, but these are the main ones and the things that we want to look for. But really what we're looking for is just, like I say, healthy plants. You know when you walk in your room, your plants are healthy, then there's nothing else to look for. And when we're giving them a, enough love, we're giving them enough time, we're giving them the right nutrients, we're giving them a decent soil to start with. And for me, and I recommend some kind of preventative to keep a lot of these problems from happening, well then we have happy plants, happy plants, happy medicine, happy medicine, happy me, <laughs> and happy all you guys. So happy growing. Any other questions? Hey guys. Um... Brian did great there. Um, we've got the Q and A started now, so good to have you on, bud. <laughs> Thanks. How you doing, Holly? I'm doing great. Um, this was a super informative class, as far as um, I think people needed to see this, um, just because so many people worry when they come up with these problems. True. Yeah. I mean, we do see the problems. Hopefully, less problems than more. Um, but, you know, you get that like scared said, post, like, oh, my God, what's happening? <laughs> and it, yeah, we get that every day. We get a lot of Yeah, that, I bet you do. <laughs> yeah. so, and we're happy to answer those questions for people. You know, they send us over their pictures. We're able to I'm look really at it, help them diagnose. Yeah, I think it's neat to do for people. You know, yeah. for me, there wasn't anybody around back then. You couldn't even, when I started, you couldn't talk about it in a store. So Honestly, it is neat there, that we're in this day and age now. There wasn't a ton of websites back then either. Like even 10 years ago, it was a little harder to find like these charts that you talk about. Um, right. They've been really helpful to me, but I know that, you know, the, the first time you notice some yellowing leaves or some curling leaves and you start to worry, um, you think you've ruined your whole plant. So it's really helpful that we have these resources. In my Absolutely. Opinion. And I really appreciated your um, take on it is nothing's unsalvageable. If you start to notice something, you know, the key is like being observant of your plants on a constant basis. Right. Well, nothing's, I mean, you can fix anything if you catch it early enough. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously you can kill a plant too, because I've done it, but, um, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> but I, I've also, um, stopped things in their tracks. So, um, we did have right. a few questions I, and I wrote them down. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, Victoria asked right away, earlier on you were talking about pH, and she asked if you could describe other neutral references for pH other than 7, because she thought you mentioned 4 to 10. Now, I know that's a, the very acidic to 10 being very alkaline, but if you want to maybe go into more depth with that. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I uh, didn't quite understand it either. If she um, updates it a little, I will... Um, ask it better but um okay well i could talk about it a little bit yeah so, you know we use those reference points of 4.01 7.01 and 10.01 um and that honestly i don't know why but uh the scientific world has used those as our reference points and that's what we use a reference solution to zero out our pens at those reference points right. um you know, but as far as what we want our plants to get, well, it's pretty, it's, it's, you know, black and white. We right. need uh, hydro plants to be between five and six and anything in soil to be between six and seven. But then we do find those sweet spots. Right. Um, right. Like in soil being 6.3, 6.4, um, and then 5.5 .5 to 5.8 in uh, hydroponics. Exactly. That's hydro. It seems to be a little bit more touchy just because you are dealing with mostly water and stuff. You've mentioned that getting the nutrients right in hydro is a little more tricky just because that's you have having to provide everything because you're not using the soil. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. There's no forgiveness in hydro. Right. Right. Now, that was an interesting thing you talked about, too, was the types of soil you use tend to have the micronutrients to, to almost to the point that your plant doesn't need to be supplemented. Um, correct. Yeah. Any of the micronutrients you're going to find in there. 
they're being they're I mean they're being formulated into these bags of soil that are all around me that you guys can't really see on camera. Um, but, oh, there's you know, some back there. All, everything uh, <laughs> organic and natural. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, feather meal, bone meal, fish meal. It's giving all that everything from the microorganisms to the micronutrients. So it's a good place to start. It is. Um, it and is. yeah, we don't usually have to add them as long as we're not reusing our soil. Uh, there are people who want to reuse the soil, and that's okay. You can do that. You can amend it by using amendments. Right. It's just a lot trickier to get it perfect. I did that a few times early on, and I think I kind of messed up my grow, too, because I was trying to add in things that I was lacking. So it does make sense to start with a good fresh soil that you know is not contaminated. Absolutely. And, and I, when you figure the price of it, you yeah. know, uh, one bag of soil will fill two five-gallon pots, which is the average was most people are growing in. So bag of soil, I mean, we've got uh, Mother Earth Groundswell. It's a great soil, mm -hmm. 22 bucks. So basically $11 soil. And even if you're on the other end spending 30 bucks a bag, $15. But new soil, you spend a you lot more solving chill. a problem. <laughs> Yes, you yeah, do. And what yeah. you get out of that plant is worth way more than 15 <laughs> bucks. Exactly. Exactly. I liked your um, natural approach, too, to things like neem oil and more organic things with essential type oils versus just, let's put a pesticide. I mean, we're going to smoke this potentially or vaporize it, and definitely people make edibles out of them. You don't want toxic chemicals on a plant like that. It's not yeah, your flower true. outside that you're trying to make look good for the Joneses or whatever. It's something you're going to consume absolutely yeah so we want it as fresh and organic as it could be it's our medicine mm -hmm. you know same like the food we're putting in our bodies we should do the best we can for it i agree but this is medicine we're ingesting it inhaling it right getting it into our bodies you, you don't know, want that yeah. in your lungs you don't want that in your stomach you don't want that in your bloodstream so absolutely not now you I'm sure i've ingested enough paraquat early on oh god yeah <laughs> Um, you mentioned one shot also. Victoria was curious about that. She did find the link, but um, do you want to talk more about that product maybe? Because I think it could be a very useful product for a lot of people. Absolutely. One shot is, like I said, by Nectar for the Gods. Uh, it's a great product. It's a slow release, but it doesn't have all the chemicals in it, like Miracle right. Grow or something like that. Oof, yeah. um, now, I haven't actually tried growing with it yet, so I sure it's a great product um we have a lot of customers that have used it that love it uh, most of them don't use just the one shot they use the one shot and then they feed at least sometimes uh yeah. but i do know that you can you can use it as a one it one sounds shot. like it's pretty safe too overall to yeah not overused like you mentioned cow mag too you really can't go overboard with it so it's always good to kind of have it in the routine yeah very important Actually, my daughter is uh, dealing with her first medical grow right now. And one of her plants, I think I might have spoken a little bit about it, but mm -hmm. it's been giving us deficiency after deficiency. Mm -hmm. And once again, two days ago, it just, the leaves became very spotted. Mm -hmm. They got yeah. light a little bit. It's a CalMag deficiency. But we've been given a CalMag at least once a week. It wants it every day, this plant. And, and different one. genetics will want different That's, things too. You can have two plants in the same tent that, need totally different things. I'm kind of going through that now, actually. I've got a sativa dominant type plant and an indica one, and it's amazing what hurts one, helps the other kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're on a seed company or a seed bank website, lots mm -hmm. of times you'll see that they classify them as easy, medium, or hard to grow. I've seen that. And there's a reason for that. Some of those harder ones, they just have a lot more deficiencies. They need to be fed a little different, a little less or a little more. So it's learning those strains. Right. So I suppose if you go through a, a strain commonly, I mean, you tend to stick to the same thing. So you probably kind of learn them over time. I think I'm starting to do that too. I mean, this is my fourth, technically fourth grow. Um, and it's nice. amazing what you pick up. But I had an infestation. I actually had spider mites outside in my hop crop. I grow hops outside. And I had to hose them with the hose, like on full bore on the thing and to clean them off. And then I used some of the, the insecticide soap and then hosed them off again. 
because I also use right. mine medically. So I wanted to clean them and it worked pretty well. I had to cut off the dead growth, but um, Carol was asking a little bit about um, if like you could maybe demonstrate hosing off a plant. And I'm thinking the way yours are grown right now, you can't cause they're in flower. Yeah, that's correct. And, and mine are indoors. And, and they're I in the, wanted, in the net. Unless so. they needed it. Yeah. Right. But I've taken mine uh, and put them in the shower and used the shower head on them. When I did get, um, a quick infestation, I caught it early. I wiped off a lot of the leaves with like watered down Esperol alcohol, and then I hosed it off and I, think I solved it but you mentioned kind of the life cycle of like if there's seed or eggs the bugs will also eventually kind of make a second appearance so it's kind of good to stay on top of that sometimes you have yes. to treat it more than once almost always uh, there are a few cases where you can get rid of it in the first treatment but mm. normally a treatment is either two three or even five treatments I've seen that recommended yeah it um, reminds me of when we had no dog flea treatment when I was a kid and we'd have to flea treat several times because of the egg life cycle. So it's similar to sure. <laughs> similar Same to thing. that. Yeah. I thought, I find it very interesting too. um, predatory mites. Yes. Now yeah, Carol asked mite. where to get those. And you mentioned that, um, the ones that are the larva, the, um, ladybugs can be hard to find and hard to get right away because I, it's always right. taken me a while to get them off of Amazon. Uh, like two weeks sometimes shipping. So you kind of want to be prepared. But what was the other uh, predatory insect you talked about? Uh, probably lacewing. Green lacewing. lacewing. Yeah, those you can almost always find. There is a company online. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Organ something organics. Starts with an A. Hopefully it'll come to me before <laughs> we finish this. Would but basically if you just go on Google and you Google... Uh, predatory insects, uh, it'll come up, or if you Google ladybugs, it'll come up. They'll be one of the first ones. Uh, something organics or something yeah. like that, and it's it's more local. It's from the and States. some garden centers will have them in your local yeah, area, too. I mean, it's worth checking out because um, when you want to act on this and you want to get something in there to help you or something on your outdoor grow, you want to get these things right away. <laughs> you don't want to yeah. wait two weeks, so... Um, I think that that's uh, something you kind of plan for. But I've also heard you can keep a few ladybugs in the fridge so you can order some and kind of have some on backup. You know, that I really don't know. I need to learn a little bit yeah. more about them. I I've read up, up a lot about them. I've uh, told people they should use them, and they've had great results, but I've never actually used them myself. So as a store, I think eventually we'll figure out what we can carry yeah. and what we keep here. But, uh, yeah. I was told. I'd be curious to find out how you can keep them chilled. Um, I, my infestation was in February. It was like winter and I was given a, another plant, a house plant, not a grow plant. And somehow it had it basically kind of got to my grow room and took in, you know, took it hold. So I ordered the ladybugs in February, got them somehow kind of quickly that time. And um, once they were done, Awesome. eating everything they tried to leave and go like out of the house like they went to the window out once they got out of the grow room it was kind of sad because i was like you guys can't go out there it's like 20 degrees and you're gonna die <laughs> there's nothing yeah, for you here <laughs> they'll die in the side too if they don't yeah have something yeah to eat, so. and that's they starved to death in the winter but um i had a few this summer that i put on the outside plants and and i i think they made a difference so i would recommend Oh, definitely. Yeah. Especially if you have an outdoor garden. Right. You, know, you should right. always add them. Yeah, they'll do so. nothing but good for you. Exactly. So a lot of people bring, I bring my plants in and out when the weather's nice just to get them some real sun and to spread them out and groom them better before I get them going. And I've noticed, I've been lucky so far, but I had had a few pest problems. So that is one reason, yeah. like you talk about keeping the grow clean, but also yourself uncontaminated. We, before yeah, you mess with your important. grow, you wouldn't even touch the tomato plants outside. Um, or yeah, like you say, when home, you mow, you get rinsed off before you go in. Right. Yeah, at home I walk past my plants like this <laughs> if I'm going to my grow room. You know, and then I'm hitting the sink first, taking yeah. off my shoes. You yeah. Know, yeah, scrubbing up like cautious. a surgeon. <laughs> yeah. But it makes sense. Um, 
Now, in the past classes, you had mentioned that there are some ways to make the plant think that it's being um, inundated with bugs or pests, and that actually yeah. makes it stronger because some of the chirpings are formed to kind of act as a defense against these insects. So That's now, obviously, you don't want to actually have insects and try to get rid of them to help your plant. You want to stick with something like that, but it's... Yeah, there's a few products that make the that just trick the plant into thinking that it is that it has bugs. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. It's like, yeah, oh, we tricked it. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure if that would make the bugs really stay off the plant. Right. Because the plant can only make more terpenes. It's really all it can do. Right. THC, more terpenes, more trichomes. Um, which I'm sure has some deterrent to some mm -hmm. bugs. Of but course. The plant itself, when you get bugs. They don't just go away because the plant now knows it's at oh, bugs. Yeah. So I'm not really, sh you know, it's good that it's going to make more terpenes and more trichomes for us just to do it for that reason. But right. to do it to try to keep it from getting infested, it's not going to work. Yeah, it just terpenes. doesn't sound practical. <laughs> right. So. But also adding potassium silicate to your plant mm -hmm. will make it a little more, uh, it'll make it harder and uh, tougher for the bugs to eat it and if it's hard and tough enough it may keep a bug from actually staying there and laying right. its eggs in the first right. place and you mentioned too having like a weaker plant or a sacrificial type plant um you talked about marigolds and i've used those outside to uh stop bugs in my garden area more around like fruit right. tomatoes um vegetables but um i've have used a really sickly clone <laughs> to get in there yeah, and works. get some of those out too. So I got to kind of play with a lot of different methods when I kind of had that freak out this February. So, so um, it was really awesome to hear the different remedies for these things also though too, and the things to watch for. Um, I, we talked about pH a little earlier, but it's, I think pH is one of the more fundamental parts to avoiding deficiencies. Oh yeah, very because important. I've wrecked a plant trying to add things. You can over fertilize. That's what I'm saying. And you mentioned that. Absolutely. So. Yeah, you burn your plants. And overwatering is another thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You want to take it easy and get to know your plants mm -hmm. and know what they can handle. Yes, yes. Well, and sometimes a problem is simply too much water, and you're starting to kind of waterlog it and get root rot and you identify it as something else. And if you go off on the deep end and start over adding things, I, I can see that being a pretty bad problem. So, and like you said, you yeah. learn as you do the, I mean, the biggest thing is get started and don't That's be right. afraid of these things. You'll face them as they come up. And I mean, what you don't succeed at, you at least learn from. Absolutely. Listen, some of our customers are, I mean, they come in here to say, listen, I don't have a green thumb. I'm never going to succeed. They're, they're negative. Mm -hmm. They've never grown anything. And they come in a bunch of times freaking out that what's going on with my plants. And right. every time I'm looking at these pictures going, oh, my God, your plants are gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, they're I fine. That color. one leaf is yellow, but big whoop. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I... No, I, there's people who actually are growing the most beautiful plants, mm -hmm. not knowing what they're doing, you know, just following some <laughs> simple guidelines. So sometimes it just all works out perfect. It does. It Or the plant is just easy for you to care for because it's the perfect plant for you. I mean, I've had some easy ones. I've had some maintenance-free ones. And then I've had some, right. not maintenance-free, but compared to the other ones I was sure. battling, I've had like a lemon OG mm -hmm. that turned out amazing. Um, and I never had to mess with her much. Just a few prunes and, you know, checking on her. But she did... She was like trouble free and I wish they could all be like that, but they, they're starting to be now that I'm on kind of my fourth grow. Um, we've had a few kind of overlaps, but I'm impressed with how much you covered in this and, um, how many of the little Thank problems you. I saw that was like, Oh, that's what I did. And it did work. It, it's, <laughs> I've had some, well, I'm trying to put as much into these classes oh, as we could. Oh, it's great. Um, no, if, if anyone right. is at that point where they've grown and they're nervous about anything, get one of those um, guides, um, the leaf issues, uh, search them. There's several nice ones on the internet that you can put up on your computer screen. You can print out, like you said, put in your grow room and you'll start to learn what to look for. I'm starting to see now when it's like a potassium thing, 
or maybe I just need to add some nitrogen because I'm starting to get some yellowing and I'm getting a lot of growth. So it, it becomes kind of second nature as you do it. Absolutely. Yeah. So just look up uh, cannabis deficiency chart and there's going to be a ton that are going to pop and up. And you guys have probably really seen everybody. those like in some of the grow groups online, people, oh, just look at this chart and, and there's some good ones out there. So, so I'll put a link in yeah, and tomorrow for the chart too and probably in the um, YouTube video because we are going to be moving this to YouTube um, this awesome. week and um, I'm so excited we'll have the whole series it's in a specific category for grow classes and um, yeah I'm just I'm thrilled that we get to do this and I hope that we get to bring awesome. more little specialty things to people in the future too because I know you were wanting to film some things at home where you can really get I, down and dirty with the plant so this has been a great collaboration for us. I mean, so many of our members in Illinois alone, where I'm at, are too afraid to get into growing without all this info. And this is all in one place. I really Excellent. appreciate it. I'm happy to put it out there for everybody. And we'll definitely get more of those specialty videos. Heck yeah. I'm excited yeah. about it. So I'm going to put some Me of too. your um, promo stuff up here. And we can talk over that while we... Uh, basically Sounds good. Yeah. i can't see what you got on screen yeah you I've won't got, be able to I'm see but at it's the back of my phone it's at it the end cameras looks like little eyes yeah it's kind of creepy it's at the end <laughs> of your creepy. um powerpoint for the thing you've got the um 10 off for the buyers club um we've got a special discount for the group uh that's right but i've got your yeah they can put an mc diy or diy mc uh, either, <laughs> either way or. to give them 10 percent off anything Anything you guys need. Uh, also, if you find anything cheaper, we're always willing to price match. If you just got questions, we're here to answer them. Yeah, I love that deal. Take a question. And if you're looking for picture. lights, yeah, cool those lights. are looking amazing. So um, I might have to try out one of those when I'm I'm looking at a house with a basement so I can <laughs> increase my grow and oh, then I'm really going to go crazy on the lights because. That's great. Now you talked about I... lights real quick before I um, I did want to talk about. Something I noticed real quick that I wanted to ask you about. Some of these lights, like these LEDs these days, are super powerful. Um, and you mentioned that they kind of are almost too much for a plant in veg, and you'll need to add nutrients because the thing's growing so fast. Is that what I understood? Well, I'm not saying too powerful in veg, but in seedling stage. Oh, sure. When they're in the seedling stage, some of these lights are just way too powerful. Definitely. So I suggest starting seeds under just a, a smaller light, anything. I mean, you can use an LED, mm -hmm. but if you're starting a seed link, for instance, use something like this. Yes. This is a 30 watt, I don't have it plugged in. It's just a little 30 watt clone light, yeah. which is great for seedlings. And it's cool because it says a Roman grow store. Um, <laughs> It's labeled. But you don't want to use one of these other ones. It's just, it's too bright. Right. But once your plants get into early vegetative stage and you put it under one of these or any really good LED, mm -hmm. wow, they, they have explosive oh. growth. Yeah. I, explosive. Have, I mentioned it probably when we talked about lights in the other class, but I have adjustable LEDs, which is really nice when you're easing them into flower and trying to, um, sure. you know, control that they're not getting. I've had heat stress before from lights, so I... I'm totally... If you have a light that's really hot, yeah, yeah. you have to be careful with yeah. that. So. Yeah, one of the things we did when we designed these was to keep the heat away, so there's really nothing... I love that. I heat. like the, the basically the kind of framing of it, too, so it's not just one board where you have to have a heat sink on top, you know, like a flat panel of uh, metal. That's one I kind of have a lot of heat trouble with, so it's just Yeah, it that's just a quantum radiates. board. Yeah. Yeah, they do radiate. We actually yeah. are coming out with two smaller lights that will mm -hmm. be quantum boards because you really can't make them like this when they're smaller um, smaller light you but they're only going to be it. yeah they'll be only 100 watt or 200 mm -hmm. 150 or 220 i think right um, you've got a big it. one like that up there on on your end there that's that's a lot of heat output if you have a flat quantum board surface. definitely yeah so yeah so i'm so actually i'm excited i just took my hps lights out in my grow room yesterday all um, right I'll be putting in one of our 650 watts nice. right next to that. I'm putting in a the 650 Gavita because mm -hmm. we want to prove to everybody how our lights are better than Gavitas. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about this. Uh, the That's only good. drag is it means I have to grow one type of all my plants got to be the same. Right. You know, so you in can order compare to do apples really to side apples. By side. 
yeah, a true so we'll be control. videotaping the whole thing. Awesome. And uh, we'll, we'll put it down to, you know, a one or two minute video so everybody can watch the two sides grow and how they grow together. I can edit that too if you want, add it to. That would be great. Sure. That'd so be awesome. I think it's great to, to, it. to let people see it, you know, I, I really knowledge is key here and being comfortable and ex just kind of experiencing these things, pictures, thank God for the internet. Um, you had some great photos up there too, by the way. I wanted to, those are really good examples of these problems. So, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no problem. We really like how you put this together. So, I'm going to put your, um, basically your Facebook page and all your social media stuff up here now. So, I mean, he's Thank got a you. Facebook page. Um, you can follow him on Instagram, even Twitter. Now, the website's also on there. Get the newsletter um, and feel you guys free definitely to help wanna... him grow. You definitely want to follow us. We're going to be doing a bunch of giveaways coming up really shortly. I'll probably announce them in the next few days. Awesome. Um, we're going to start giving away one light every month. So mm -hmm. follow us. As get the newsletter. Us, you'll be able to get on our contest. So. Yep. Sign up for our newsletter. Awesome. Come on in. Heck yeah. Uh, September 12th. Yes. September 12th is our end of the year party. Are you going to be here, Holly? I sh I'm going to try to be there. A lot of crazy stuff so. going on here, but I I always have a good time at those. So um, yeah, it's, this is uh, going to be. We're going to have the full 90s gonna be band. Cooler. We're going to have thousands of dollars in giveaways. Nice. Uh, a lot of contests. A lot of samples. It's going to be a lot of fun, and that's all day. It'll start about 11 o'clock, and it'll go till five or six. Awesome, awesome. So it's yeah. yeah the daytime ones are great when it's not super hot, and I mean. You know, if you want to get your hands on these and actually look at them, not like you can look at them on the internet, um, this is a great time to go in, ask questions. I mean, you guys are, are always ready to answer them. Everyone in there Absolutely. is always friendly and helpful. So, thanks. So. We shoot to be like that. Heck yeah! So, um, so this will be up on YouTube. Um, I'll probably cut out the discount parts and just do a little ending thing here. But for you guys at home. <laughs> This is part of the benefit of being an MC DIY member. So, um, Brian, thank you so much for all this. All right, thank you, Holly. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey. Good night, everybody. Happy growing. Any questions, just call. Yeah, just call. Send a picture. They're cool with that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. All right, have a great night. All right, you too. Good night. Bye.